Okay. This is a, a little bit extended version of a presentation I did just one hour ago for 15 minutes. This time I'm gonna be 30. So I'm gonna talk about NFBI upgrades and migrations with uh, critical telco workloads. Thank you. So the key takeaway message I want to deliver to you today is uh, one achievement is to develop and provision a full telco cloud solution in service that requires development, integration, testing, verification, service delivery, acceptance. Once you do that on the infra, then you have to onboard all the applications. Uh, that's quite a, a challenging long procedure that eventually results in service and cheering and applause. But another, another major achievement is to actually maintain this cloud solution in service during the whole lifespan. And that means to keep the software lifecycle management of the cloud. Basically, NFBI upgrades. In Ericsson, we have a very old concept from the 70s called ISP, in service performance. This concept existed even before the concept of internet service provider, but uh, so far it's not very popular outside only between Ericsson and customers, but uh, ISP basically means uh, how is my telco equipment performing and uh, how can I secure it is permanently performing, so there is a, a permanent uptime. So normally people relate ISP to 99.999% of availability, the famous five nines. In the, Back in the 70s, there were three main industries that could deliver five nines of uh, quality. Uh, nuclear plants, aerospace, and good old telco switches for normal coal making. Anyway, my name is uh, Gerardo Martinez. I am the NFBI CICD lead solution architect. There is a program in Ericsson called NFB program, where we, we are basically a very dynamic team that uh, takes the challenging job of combining the Ericsson infrastructure with the Ericsson application, putting them all, all together and making sure that uh, applications and infra are gluing as expected. In, in, our, in, our program, in our program, we don't particularly deliver a solution. We just make sure that the applications and the infra meet the requirements and the expectations. So later, uh, other areas in Ericsson can develop uh, 5G core solution, uh, IMS, etc. This is a very dynamic team. It's spread all over the, the world on all the Ericsson R&D sites. My day starts very early in the morning with uh, getting in touch with uh, Chinese colleagues, Asians, Indians, and it ends with uh, people in North America. But uh, basically, we can put all this in an equation called NFB. And NFB is just a combination of NFBI, VNFs, the so-called OpenStack VM-based applications, CNFs, the containerized ones, and LCM, lifecycle management. Some other people also like to refer LCM as MANO and include the orchestration part. So you might hear about NFB MANO uh, as a process that involves both virtualization technology and orchestration. What do we do? We basically test with the latest Ericsson NFBI software before it's released to our customers. We perform LCM activities. So basically, we do a full NFBI upgrade of the infrastructure with applications on top running traffic. And after that, we perform resilience tests, the typical resilience test that uh, every customer would like to see. What happens if I reboot this compute? What happens if I reboot this switch? Um, and, and things like that. After all these uh, resilient tests are done and the upgrade is done, we, we give our recommendation to the whole 
release process of uh, NFBI software solution, and this one is released and reach what we call GA, general availability. So then the solution is available to our customers. What are the forces behind upgrades? Why do we upgrade? What are the triggers? So first reason, because we want a new feature. There is a feature that we cannot get in the current software, so we upgrade our system in order to get certain features, certain capability. Second reason, and widely accepted today, is because we want to keep up to date with the security fixes. We all know that uh, from here until the future, there will all be always a new vulnerabilities discovered, and, and it's almost now a routine that every three months we just have to do security fixes. Bug fixes, that is not probably the, the favorite of our customers. Our customers would not like to upgrade a system just because there is a fault to be fixed, but we also try to put the fixes there. And finally, lifecycle and, and support, which means the, the cloud is running a little bit too old to the point that it's not, uh, there is no business on maintaining such an old software, and, and therefore the, the, the vendors, they say, uh, we, we, we can support you until this date, and, and after this date, we cannot just keep maintaining the software, providing the support. Then we convince our customers, they decide to go for the upgrade. So what is our customer's expectations? Well, first of all, they expect a carefully verified upgrade procedure. They really expect what we are about to do is written, prepared, very clearly explained to them, because they are running live traffic. All your phone's data are most, most likely connected to this uh, live telco. They expect uh, downtime management. You tell them this is the amount of time that the system will be out of service, and you have to deliver that promise. Control risk. If something doesn't go as, as expected, then customers expect that you go back to a safe point, you cancel the activity, you postpone it, and, and you try to understand what went wrong. Sometimes upgrades, especially in cloud, could be either not possible, uh, was just before in a talk about uh, how obsolete your cloud can be, or too disruptive. The, the downtime is so major that it's better not to perform the upgrade with live, but instead you reroute the traffic, you do traffic offload, try to move the traffic somewhere else. And then we also fall into famous wording situation. What is exactly upgrade? Why we don't call it update? And there is this famous story that somebody reports, oh, I have upgraded my Kubernetes cluster to uh, 1.23. And then you ask, OK, so you did this rolling upgrade procedure uh, with the application inside. And then they might say, no, no, I just delete the cluster and restore a higher version, and I restore everything again. Well, in telco, we don't call that an upgrade. That we call a reinstallation, or I prefer to call that an uplift, meaning you are bringing your cluster, your OpenStack, to a higher software level, but you are not really doing a live upgrade. Then, having said that, let me show you a bit how is more or less the Ericsson solution, but just trying to point out the, the generic uh, open source protocols we, we support. Uh, overall, the Ericsson and FBI solution is composed by hardware, switching, fabric. We meet all these standards, IEEE, IEEE, RFCs, famous protocol, IPMI, that uh, it's a standard, but it was strongly driven by the, by the industry in the early 2000s. Rack scale design, Redfish. Then you have the virtualization layer, OpenStack, Open Daylight, Open Virtual Switch. And then on top of that, you have the containerization layer. Uh, I, I guess you have heard in the summit they, they use this uh, terminology Loki, Linux, OpenStack. Kubernetes infrastructure, well, it's, a, it's another way to represent what in the end is a normal practice in the industry. Still, we, we are also trying to deliver solutions where we try not to have the OpenStack layer in between. That, that is something that we are also working on. 
and there we have the, the CNFs and the, and the BNFs. Inside each of these boxes, in our program, there is a team of two, three persons sitting somewhere in the world who are experts on that box. And that's a, a very cool thing of this program. It's a crossroad of many cultures, many countries, many R&D centers under the same cultural co uh, company culture. Let me talk now about uh, some telco industry facts and practices. Why the telco industry is so special? First of all, regulation. The telco industry since the very beginning has been a regulated industry. You, you cannot become an operator, a telco operator from your garage. You cannot build a startup. Uh, uh, and call it telco operator. That will be quite difficult. You normally need to go to the government, you need to auction for a band frequency or get the right to make a hole in the street to throw a fiber, etc. It's a complicated process. So therefore there is regulation. And there is a very famous factor linked to, to telco industry, which is emergency services, the so-called 911 in America, 112 in Europe. Emergency services have binding legal commitments meaning uh, you cannot bring down that service for any reason whatsoever. There have been histories on the news that when this service is down in some countries, the, the, the country deploys the police into the street just to listen if there is some emergency happening. So the, this is a very serious thing that can never be out of service. Okay? A standardization. Uh, this is quite different to the way how open source works. In, uh, in the standardization industry, the standards are built first, and then the products are implemented later. So there is a big discussion about building certain standards, the rules of the game, and after that discussion is agreed, then everybody starts the race to build. That this is very important on the low layers. So still today, layer one, two, three, I mean, for optical fibers, I mean, you have to specify even the characteristics of the connectors, uh, etc. I mean, it's, uh, it's not something that, again, you can decide uh, by your own. And, and we have a very long tradition uh, of thinking in that way. So open source is something, is, we, couldn't, we cannot say it's so new anymore. We have been um, now more than 10 years uh, adopting open source, but uh, it's not from where we come from. There, there used to be these uh, telco generic requirements uh, in the 70s, when the Bell companies split in the US, there were these so-called baby Bells, and then there was a core that was split in two, the Bell Labs and the Bell Core. The Bell Core nobody talks about too much, but Bell Core is the one that uh, tells you how, how should be the rules of the game. Then Bell Core became a company called Telcordia, and they have these famous uh, GRs, generic requirements, which is what defines if, uh, if a product is telco grade or not. Those requirements still exist. Interestingly, Telcordia was acquired by Ericsson in 2012. It became part of Ericsson. And today, Telcordia has evolved in what we could call automation network operations. So all, the whole mano industry comes from, from Telcordia. Among all these generic requirements, there is a famous concept that we also like in Telco a lot, which is called the first office application concept, the FOA. FOA means first time. So in the world, when an operator takes the confidence uh, relation with the vendor to do a first time in production, that is called FOA. The product is not yet officially released is only released to this particular customer, uh, then the product goes live, and after the product goes live, something very interesting comes, uh, happens, that all the tier one, tier two, tier three operators have start to talk to the FOA customer, and they start to get feedback about that product, and that feedback will be very important to define later uh, how good is your product. That, that is something very important in, in the industry. Once this is done, the FOA is successful, then we can declare this GA again. This is more or less the way how Telco has been working all the way. Finally, Telco usually covers a geographical area. 
uh, contrary to IT that you go almost immediately right worldwide in some cases, or uh, the coverage of IT industry can be very vast. Uh, telco operators come from uh, the fact that they cover a, a geographic area. So therefore, when you want to do upgrades, you have to do them when the traffic is low, and then the concept of maintenance window comes into place. The nights, when people is sleeping, weekends, moments in time where you can take the risk of performing an upgrade. Upgrades happen, therefore, during low traffic periods, night, weekends, but they don't happen all the time. They are very important steps for customers today. So we are not there yet. There will be a moment where CICD will be uh, adopted by the telco industry. In that moment, we could assume that upgrades happen all the time, but today it's not the case. So having said that, we can see a summary of uh, the, the steps I just described. You prepare a few days, you do some offline work, you do some diagnostic in the data center, uh, and then the night of the upgrade comes, you do this activity, post checks, if the things go okay, you confirm, complete the upgrade. If something goes not as expected, then you roll back. Then let's assume the upgrade is successful. There is some offline work, offline work again, post monitoring, alarm check-ins, etc. The site can never be left broken in a change activity. Cannot just leave it broken if it's gone, if it's uh, upgraded and go. Either the change completes successfully, or you have to roll back to an state that is safe. And sometimes within the night. The matter of fact is today is that upgrading a data center in one night is literally impossible. And then we fall into the challenges. Uh, we get many questions from our customer. How, or, how big our data center should be? We would like to have a large data center or many sm small ones. Well, one criteria to decide how big your data center should be is how long you are up to take for the upgrade for the software maintenance. So larger data center, the upgrade will take longer. And if we start to consider that you cannot upgrade every night, but some nights, like the weekend, you might end up taking months to upgrade a data center. In some cases, it could be the case. So, have to be very mindful in telco about the size of the data center. Sometimes too big could result in very long upgrades. Multi-tenancy challenges. Uh, our customers, they want to exploit until the last core available of the computes. Therefore, they would like to deploy all these VMs and Kubernetes clusters in a, in a, normally in a static way. We are not like the public cloud where you can just uh, create a cluster with a button. Normally, all these products are deployed, fixed. Uh, but then you fall into this so-called Tetris game. We, we call this the, the Tetris, meaning that uh, some computes might have VM from one VNF and another VNF, and what happens if you bring that compute down? You might fall in infinite combinations of consequences. So therefore, you have to know very well what you're going to put together, because when that compute is rebooted, you might affect two VNFs that might end up affecting the, 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 what we call the call path, the traffic flow. Another important thing, backups. A, a backup that doesn't restore is not, cannot be called itself a backup. <laughs> so the main purpose of a backup is to use it in case of emergency. And in, in, in cloud technology, sometimes that backup can be the image of a VM, which could be quite a very big uh, file, or databases. Sometimes uh, exporting those backups, importing those backups could take longer than just redeploying a system. And then we fall into something which is very sensitive to our customers. If we have to roll back, sometimes it's better to redeploy than to restore from the backup. 
And this in telco is a very sensitive issue because redeploy is something that at, at first is, uh, is sounds scary. But uh, with the proper explanation, you can explain to the customer that uh, redeployment of a stateless cluster might be faster than, than uh, just uh, restoring the backup. Still, we do backups. I mean, uh, you, you never know uh, what is the best way in the end. But yeah, that's another thing to keep in mind. Traffic resilience. This is a good one. Sometimes you discover resilience issues in your deployment when you do the upgrade. Because a, a very golden rule is if your system is resilient, then your upgrades will be successful. So upgrades is about resilience. It's about uh, cutting the resilience of your system so you can upgrade the passive side and, and then the active side can, can stay and then you can switch, etc. So quite often it happens that during the upgrade you discover that there were some resilience situations that were present before the upgrade, but because you happen to be doing the upgrade, you uh, expose them. And then the upgrade gets this impression that, okay, the upgrade is failing, and then you find out later in the postmortem, no, the upgrade was doing what it's supposed to do, but the system was not resilient as expected. Some configuration issue, or it could be anything. Another interesting one, migrations, or what we call in Kubernetes uh, pod evictions. So let's say I want to upgrade this host. Then you have the possibility to bring down the VM, leave it on the host, sleeping until the VM until the host is back, or you can migrate the VM, leave the compute empty, do the upgrade. Uh, here I like to say, I like to always make an analogy. Uh, OpenStack VMs to me is like a football, because the VM you can imagine like a soccer ball that you can, uh, everybody knows where it is, everybody knows the, the, the role of the game. Normally in a VNF you can remember in your mind the number of different VMs that uh, are in forming that VNF. So it's like a soccer match, very simple to watch, you know where the ball is, etc. Uh, what is the purpose of the game. With containers, uh, I make the analogy without falling into this popular, what is more popular, soccer or pool, but when you, uh, containers is like playing pool. It's like you get on a stick, you hit the, the white ball, then the white ball hits the other 10 balls and you have six holes and, and all these containers just move around when you do this eviction. And there you have to be very careful because uh, most of the cases what you do a drain and you can fall into a situation where one container doesn't want to leave the cluster. And that is connected to the next topic. Pod disruption budget. This is something that is very important in telco applications. Every application has to do the, the right homework on, on pod disruption budget because uh, not doing this properly could result in a container saying, no, I don't want to leave the worker. I, I am too important to, to leave. I need to stay in service. And then you can fall into a situation where your upgrade is uh, hanging because that container doesn't want to leave. So very important, this concept. Don't, please don't forget it, pod disruption budget. What else? Uh, reboots, power off and power on. Very famous telco requirement. An equipment has to always recover by itself if, if you have a sudden loss of power. This, uh, this requirement comes from the fact that many telco equipments are spread uh, in, in, in very harsh geographic places. And the expectation is that if you get a power loss, and the power is back, the system should be back without manual intervention. That is, that is a very tough <laughs> requirement to meet, uh, a telco requirement to meet. And then you have these reboots, and customers do not like reboots. Reboots, uh, is, it means uh, time, losing time, waiting. Therefore, here we have to always make sure that we try to align all the reboots. If we're going to upgrade a compute, we try to make sure the number of reboots is the minimum possible because uh, a customer doesn't want to hear that you are rebooting a compute three or four times during an upgrade. That is not uh, efficient. And furthermore, well, I will 
explain a bit all this, uh, what I call the advanced level. For example, elasticity versus rollback. When you start to upgrade a cloud, your VMs or your containers start to move around. Therefore, it's inefficient and I will say very, very difficult or even more painful to put the things the way they were before than just to leave them as they are. So rollback and elasticity, they have a bit of a compromise there. So it's very important to convince the customer that the VM's gonna move and if we decide to stop here for the night, there is nothing wrong that the VMs are sitting in a new place as long as the, the service is there. Again, downgrade versus redeployment. Uh, downgrade could be also related to rollback, but uh, in general, redeployment is something that needs a lot of careful explanation to our customer why we have to redeploy, why we have to uh, go back to the previous software. I, in the IT industry, sometimes you might find uh, products that do not support rollback, that uh, you, you really have to leave them as they are. In telco, this is very hard to digest, but uh, that's the case. Uh, hardware intent dependencies. So something we have also noticed is that uh, there is this area of uncertainty between Nix firmware and Linux kernel drivers. Sometimes you might be surprised that one depends of the other in a different way as you expect. So sometimes you might have to upgrade the firmware before the driver or sometimes you might have to upgrade the driver before the firmware and that is a bit uh, uh, there you have to be careful and read very well why you are upgrading the firmware, why you are upgrading the driver. And finally, uh, NFBI migrations driven by traffic rerouting. Sometimes it happens that the whole process of providing traffic into an NFBI is not happening on the NFBI but in the IP network, in the, in the, in the, in the routers. So the process of, of loading traffic occurs in a different layer than the data center. And telco customers have issues to, to accept this because the traffic department normally is a different department than, than the one that is managing the FBIs. So uh, when you do an operation in one layer, do not, you don't want to be depending on another layer that uh, you have to bring the experts there. And, and, and the same happened with uh, and uh, open stack upgrades on the applications. I mean, the, it's, it's very difficult for one night to have the application expert, the infra expert, the routing expert, all sitting together waiting to see if there is an issue. So this is uh, very important to, to consider. Finally, I would like to close with the fact that we did a successful upgrade. And what happens when you upgrade goes through and is successful. And I can tell you as, as a personal experience after upgrading the same lab for two years every three months. Basically, you end up attached to the lab. You feel that the lab is your pet. And then I would like to ask you, how many of you knows about this uh, famous story, cat, uh, pet versus cattle? Yeah? It's a very famous story that uh, you should, because especially because cloud tells you you have to treat the servers as cattle, not as pet. You cannot fall in love of a compute. That is not good. <laughs> because then the compute becomes untouchable. But now let's talk in a higher level. You have a data center with 100 computes. Let's assume that every compute is a cattle. Uh, but you fall in love of the data center and the data center becomes your pet. You know the story, you saw it grow, you, you know the strengths, you remember the compute that failed and you, you, you know what is the leaf or the spine that gives you more trouble, etc. So you treat it as a pet. But we are an industry and we have to deliver cattle. So procedures, first they have to work equally on every data center. All data centers have, must be fully predictable, although the upgrade procedure will never be a unique procedure. Uh, every data center in a way is different. You, you expect to provide something that will behave the same everywhere. And they also grow and develop. So how do you solve this problem? How do you deliver cattle and pet at the same time? And, and I'm trying to solve this problem today. 
and my answer is horse. <laughs> Why horse? No pet, no cattle, horse. Well, it's a, maybe a nice way to, to end the presentation. You cannot have a horse at home. <laughs> Uh, luckily for our, our vegetarian colleagues, uh, horses are not as popular for uh, for meal. And uh, and horse can be very well trained animals. They I, I am I had a recently uh, the impression of uh, ho how good they can be trained, and this is what we expect uh, from a cloud to to behave as a horse. <laughs> So I would like finally to thank uh, Brett Kofut, who could not make it to the summit, but uh, he was helping me to build this material. And uh, there you can reach me on LinkedIn, or if you want to talk to me, my pleasure. Thank you. Any question? Ah, maybe we should have a question session. Yes, sorry. So, uh, just wondering, we talked about the challenges uh, in the production environment, but do we have any way forward to mitigate those challenges in future, like from an action side or from other uh, developments? Like we have uh, the challenges at the infrastructure level, then we have the challenges at uh, different uh, open stack levels. So, do we? Well, yes, so the question is how to mitigate some of these challenges. The first thing that comes to my mind is that uh, although a Loki or NFBI system is composed by multiple layers, we, we would like those layers to have certain intelligence to communicate to each other during the process. So you can make a vertical code and say one compute host is connected to a switch, it has OpenStack, Kubernetes, and an application on top. Ideally, you would like that all these layers are aware about what is going on. So then the layers can prepare uh, better for, for this resilience scenario. So uh, obviously, I'm, I'm talking, for example, reboot, and reboot alignment is uh, one way to, to, to mitigate this. So you, you try to make sure everybody takes a new software but you want to hold the reboot as long as possible, so when then you do only one reboot. And uh, regarding the upgrades, uh, or updates we are talking about, the Tarnas Foundation is talking about upgrades to the Cloud. Uh, is uh, the mention like it can take like five to seven days, or maybe a week, or something like that? Yeah. Okay, uh, upgrade times, that is always a good one. <laughs> I, I get asked all the time how long this upgrade is going to last. And the answer is the, the upgrade time doesn't fully depend on the infra. It depends on what you have on top and the capability to survive resilience scenarios. Because if you do parallel upgrade of all the computes at the same time, you might finish very quick, but then you, you lose the service. So. It's very hard to measure duration because you really need to know the data center and then come with a diagnostic. And what, what we want to do, we don't want to say it takes this amount of minutes, hours, or days. We want to talk in maintenance windows. And that's why I, I brought the subject into the presentation because uh, the ideal situation is first to ask the customers, tell me how is your, uh, when is your maintenance window, how many hours are, because it's not the same in a big city than in a small town. And then coming to the proper measure of maintenance window, you can say, okay, I can deliver this upgrade to you in this amount of maintenance windows. So uh, in the end, there is not uh, an easy answer. 
Edge, edge Cloud, they probably going to have faster upgrades because we always expect the Edge uh, will be smaller. Uh, but yeah. And Edge Cloud is also the offering for Edge in future? We, we have some Edge uh, in the portfolio, yes. And, and we have also a cloud run uh, happening as, as we speak. Because, uh, yeah, it, what is expected in the future is that uh, any base station will be like a mini data center, right? So, thank you. Any other question? Are we run out of time? So, yeah, I guess we are five minutes late. So, thank you very much. Enjoy the show.